Hi everyone. If you want to learn about logical switching or creating segments in NanoSex, stick around. We're going to cover the topic. This is a part one of a two-part series. This part is lecture only, so you know exactly what we're talking about as we go through. And then part two, which will follow, will be a demo. Okay, so we'll show you how to create it and all that wonderful stuff. So stick around. Thanks very much. See you soon. Hi everybody, uh, welcome uh, to the channel. Uh, I'm Steve DeBarros and uh, we're gonna talk about what NSXT or NSX logical switches are. Um, now you'll see I got two different ways of referring to this, NSX or NSXT. If you watch some of the other uh, videos, you'll know that prior to 4.0, NSX, NSX, NSX were called NSXT. After, once 4.0 came out, they rebranded the name, just call it NSX. So NSX, NSXT, tomato, tomato, whatever. So we're going to look at, at segments here or switching. We're going to talk to, basically about that. I'm going to do a whole different thing on routing altogether, but there are certain things we need to understand. Okay, first thing, what is a segment? So we'll talk about that uh, very, very fast. Uh, we'll talk about what an overlay network is. We'll talk about what a VTAP or a TAP is. This is a virtual tunnel endpoint or tunnel endpoint. We'll talk about those. And again, if you've taken, if you um, uh, watch the video on setting up a cluster, or sorry, what NSX is about. I touched on these very briefly. We'll talk about what a transport zone is. We need to understand all this stuff before we start creating segments. Um, another thing some people basically um, are concerned about, whenever you virtualize things, and I remember back when virtualization was just starting to get very popular. Uh, this was back in the virtual infrastructure 3.0 days, so 2007. 2008, there was a lot of pushback. You know, well, that's uh, we're not we're, we're not virtualizing our workloads. Today, it's pretty comfortable. People are pretty comfortable virtualizing it. They see the benefit from it. Um, but now, when we talk about virtualizing network services, again, you get that pushback, right? One of the common things I usually hear is, "Oh, now you you don't have I don't have a vis I don't have visibility in my environment." And that's absolutely not true whatsoever. You know exactly what that packet or frame is going from one end to the other. You can examine all that. Um, oh, we'll do a packet walk in this in this session, um, but for the most part, showing you how to do packet captures. I'll do that on troubleshooting lab or troubleshooting session. Uh, we'll talk about how, how do we handle uh, uh, ARP traffic, right? How do we handle this thing called BUM, broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast traffic? How do we handle that? So we'll take a look at that. Uh, this is a very long video, so I'll probably put maybe some uh, some uh, timestamps on where if you just want to see the uh, how we handle ARP traffic or if you just want to see the tables, the VTAP tables being built, I'll leave little. I'll put that in the comments where you can just kind of look, go to that section or that timestamp to view it. But ideally, if you could view the whole thing from front to back, that would be great. So what is an NSX switch? So you'll see here, I'm referring to switching, uh, and it says switching is accomplished using these things called segments. So you'll hear ter sw the term switching and segments used very interchangeably. Um, one of them has to do with using, it's basically uh, using the po uh, policy APIs. We call them segments. Back in the old days, we used to call them um, switches. Again, tomato, tomato, if you call it a switch or segment, whatever. You know, it's not the end of the world, right? So a segment or switch represents a single broadcast domain. So if I have VMs on that same segment, think of it as like a VLAN. Uh, so VMs on that same segment, they're on the same subnet, they could talk to each other. VMs on different segments, so if I create two different segments, I'm going to demo all this stuff too. VMs on two different segments can't talk to each other. They need to go through a layer three device, a router, which again, will be in another video on that altogether, right? Um, so virtual machines and their containers connect their virtual NICs. So these VMs and containers have virtual NICs. You connect those to segments, okay? Actually, you connect it to a segment port on a segment, all right? There are two types of segments that we can create in NSX. There is an overlay segment and a VLAN back segment. Uh, the one we're going to be focusing on right now is overlay. Uh, overlay segments use Geneva for encapsulation. All right. So we'll talk about what that is if you're not sure what that is. Um, and we'll see the benefit of having overlay networks. Uh, VLAN back networks, just a really quick thing on this. Uh, a VLAN back network or a VLAN back segment 
It's a segment that has a VLAN ID on it. Okay, well, that kind of makes sense. Uh, but it also allows us to get out to the real world. Now, you'll see that more when I get into routing. Um, you know, I've got my virtual environment using overlay networks going east to west. Now I need to get out of the environment. I need to go from my virtual to my physical. Um, that would be, uh, we'd be going through overlay networks and then eventually hitting a VLAN back segment. So we'll talk a bit more about that um, in the routing and also in the firewall um, session as well. Now, each overlay segment is assigned a VNI ID, a virtual network identifier. Think of this as a VLAN on steroids. This is how we identify traffic from one segment to another. Oh, it's got this VNI ID. Okay, so all these guys are in the same segment, or if they're different VNIs, they're different segments. Um, VMs connected to the same segment can talk to each other. I mentioned that. VMs on different segments can't talk to each other. The only way they can do that is to go through a gateway, right? Um, one of the things I, I do want to mention uh, here when we talk about VNI IDs, virtual network identifiers, so a Geneva VNI ID is 24 bits long. So that basically gives you almost 17 million different combinations, right? So that's a lot. A VLAN is only 12 bits long. So a VLAN ID is only 12 bits. It's 2 to the power of, um, uh, of 12 uh, basically gives me 4,096. I'm only allowed, can't use 0, can't use 4, uh, 496. So basically, I have up to 4,094 VLANs available to me, right? So if you ever run into a situation, like maybe you've got a, a customer or something where maybe your hosting provider and you don't have enough VLANs to support all your customers, you don't have to worry about that if you use stuff like Geneva and overlay networks. Um, that could um, relieve a lot of um, problems with the lack of having enough VLAN IDs or using private VLANs or whatnot. Anyways, let's get back to the switching. So here is an example of an overlay network. So when I look here, I've got, first of all, I've got some hosts. I've got four hosts, ESXi, ESXi 01, 02, 03, and 04. Um, I've got a network card here. This is my, my uh, a physical card inside my server. We call them VMNIC adapters, so VMNIC, they're physical. Uh, now, I'm not showing management networks here or anything like that, just to keep the diagram simple, okay? Um, you'll see I have a distributed switch here. And, oh yeah, by the way, these physical cards are plugged into physical switches. These are just layer two devices. Notice I got a router separating these, the host on the left and the host on the right. There are two different broadcast domains. This is one layer two network on the left, another layer two. Now, the problem with something like this, if you're a vSphere person and you create a virtual switch, whether it's standard or distributed, I don't care. Uh, one of the problems with having this router in the, uh, the bottom there is the layer three device is if you try to create a port group across here, let's say you're going to create a port group and attach VMs to it, the VMs on the left side would be able to talk to each other, but they will not be able to talk to any of the VMs on the right side. And same thing on the right, any VMs on the right side of the router will be able to talk to each other on that port group, but they won't be able to talk to anybody on, a, on that same port group on the other side. And the reason for that is uh, if this VM wanted to talk to this VM over here, it'd have to do an ARP which is a broadcast, so it would have to get flooded out and that router would stop it. I talked about that in, uh, in our um, uh, What is NSX video and stuff. Actually, I talked about it in preparing our NSX transport node, so if you want to go through and, uh, that, that would be good. I'll leave links for that video as well, uh, where I kind of go through and explain it. So anyways, so because I have this router in the middle here, maybe the servers on the left are in one rack, the servers on the right are in another rack, and we've our racks are where we terminate our layer two and we're connecting our racks together in a leaf spine topology via a router. So that could be a, a good example here. So like I said, if you did something like that, you'd say, sorry, you can't make port groups across those racks. With overlay networks, we can. So in this picture here, you'll see I created a segment. I called it web segment, doesn't really matter. Whatever its IP, whatever its subnet is, it's got a VNI ID in this example of 5001. You'll notice I've got VMs plugged into it. So VM1 has an IP of IP1 and a Mac of Mac1. And you'll see, let me clean my picture again. Oops. Oh, it's hard to have. I don't want to do this. There we go. Guess I'm going to have to fix that. All right. So here we go. 
So in this example, I've got a segment here, web segment. You'll see I actually have VMs that have their virtual NICs plugged into a port on that segment. So these VMs, all four of these VMs are on the same subnet, in this case the 172.16 network, whatever the case may be, all right? Um, these TEPs, sorry, um, we have these things called TEPs in Geneva, right? Um, so Geneva is our encapsulation protocol. The TEPs job is to encapsulate and decapsulate our Geneva um, frames, okay? So when this VM over here, let's say, let me clear this screen here, come on. Clear. When this VM on the, I'll use light blue, when this VM over here sends a frame out, let's say it wants to talk to VM4 on the far right, what will happen here is that frame that gets, gets generated by VM1, and we've got a packet walk coming up, will hit the tap, the tap on this side, this is the source tap on the left, encapsulates that frame, the original frame. So it's going to take it, jam it inside Geneve, and fire it across the network to that destination tap. How does it know where that is? I'll tell you a little bit later on in the video, okay? Uh, when we get into tables. So it would send it over there. Now the tap on the far right, its job is to decapitate it or decapsulate it. So it looks at the Geneve header, says, yep, that's me. Takes that Geneve header, throws it in the garbage, takes the original frame, the layer two frame, and it forwards it up to the VM. So again, you see what left here on the, let me change my colors, I'll go with uh, orange. The frame that left VM1 over here on the far right is the exact same frame that arrived over at this VM4. These VMs are completely unaware of this. So this is kind of cool. So you just, this is what we call the overlay network, this segment up here, and that's a layer two network. So we just successfully created a layer two network on top of a layer three network. Down here, it could be a cloud. This is physical down below. I don't care what it is, okay? Uh, one thing I didn't point out here is our taps, in this example, this segment is on a distributed switch, a vSphere distributed switch. So you could think of this, if you're more of a vSphere person, just think of a uh, NSX segment as a port group, because really, that's really what it is. But it's kind of supercharged with VNI capabilities, okay? With overlay. So that's kind of how we can look at that. Uh, and you'll see that this NIC plugs into an uplink on our distributed switches. I'm just kind of showing you that. So real quick over, uh, overview on what an overlay network is. Now, one of the requirements, since we're taking this original frame that's leaving here and encapsulating it down at the bottom, we're making that larger. So we need an MTU. Again, VMware recommends today an MTU of 1700 at least. Okay, they want, uh, as opposed to, you could get away with 1600, it would work, but 1700, um, is what they recommend, and I'll show you why when we look at the Geneve frame or header information. Now, what is a transferred zone? Let me just read through it. So, a transferred zone, there's two types of them. There's the overlay transferred zone and the VLAN transferred zone. So, a transport zone says used for NSX segments that utilize Geneve to provide layer 2 over layer 3 encapsulation. Let's back up on my picture. When I prepare this host, and you folks see me do that in the demo. If you haven't watched it, watch that preparing a host demo, right? Or preparing a transport node demo. I'll leave links in the comment. When you're preparing this, one of the things it asks you is, what transport zone is this host in? And when you add, let's say, all these hosts to a particular transport zone, when I create an NSX segment, like for example, the one up here, web segment, when I create that, so how does it know, so how does it know um, what the span of this segment is. When you create the segment with an SX, and I'll show you that in a demo when I get to doing demos in the next part, part two of this. Uh, when you create a segment, first thing it asks you is what transport zone does this thing belong to? And when you say, oh, it belongs to whatever this overlay transport zone I created, then it knows, okay, this host, this host, this host, this host, whatever other hosts are part of that transport zone. How does it know that? Because when you prepared the host, see that first video on preparing host, one of the things when you're preparing it, it says what transport zones or zone is this host in, okay? Uh, sorry, I'm scratching there, got a bite. Um, so that's what a transport zone is. A VLAN transport zone is used to connect to the physical network. We'll talk about edge gateways in our tier one gate, or sorry, our tier zero gateways. So um, I'll definitely readdress that in the routing, but just for now, a VLAN back segment, it's just a segment that does not use overlay technology. So it's not using Geneva. It's just a regular 
it's just think of it like a port group basically okay uh, I'll talk touch on some differences when I get into routing and firewall stuff on that but for now that's kind of the basics that you can get away with so what is Geneve? Geneve uh, allows us to create a layer 2 network on top of a layer 3 network which I've kind of explained before some of you that might be familiar with VXLAN or if you played with NSX for vSphere we used VXLAN there I remember when NSXT came out, I was like, oh, okay, it's probably using VXLAN, and I, and I wasn't uh, aware of that. I said, oh, hang on a second, it's using Geneve. What's Geneve? What's the big deal? Why, why did they change it from VXLAN? And VXLAN was a specification developed by, like, Cisco, IBM, a whole bunch of Juniper, a whole bunch of partners and stuff like that. VMware was in on it as well. So, and then when you look at the Geneve specification, what I noticed is, like, Microsoft and Red Hat, it's a lot of software companies, and what they did is they took the VXLAN spec and they kind of extended it with Geneve. They made it a little bit better um, for future growth and capabilities. That's kind of the idea of it. But anyways, we use Geneve. We'll see the header in a minute. Geneve uses TEPs. You can call them VTEPs. You can call them TEPs, tomato, tomato, or whatever. And I mentioned that before. Again, when we were preparing our host, again, in that first video, it created a TEP for us, or TEPs, depending on your teaming policies you picked. And a TEPs job is to encapsulate or decapsulate the new frame. All right, so which it says right here. Uh, so it encapsulates, decapsulates the traffic, which is transparent to the VM. The VM is completely unaware of this going on. Geneve uses port 6081 UDP. I always usually get questions in class. Hey, Steve, how come it's UDP, not TCP, right? TCP is connection-oriented, handshaking, and so on, whereas UDP is more spray and pray. I'm going to blast it, and hopefully it gets there. Um, what you don't want happening, since we're encapsulating frames inside Geneve, you don't want to have Geneva using TCP and a frame or a pack, another packet in there using TCP. Now you could potentially get this double handshaking or TCP over TCP meltdown, which causes issues. So Geneva just uses UDP. If there's a, a packet that's being captured that is sensitive and it uses TCP, that's fine. If it gets dropped somewhere along the line, it'll get retransmitted just like it would normally, okay? So this is one of the reasons. So that's okay. So you want to make sure you got UDP port. 6081 in your Geneve network running. Uh, here's, uh, I just got this picture off the internet for the Geneve header. Um, I just want to point out a couple things here. There's, I'm not going to go through every field. It's not required. But there's my layer 2 stuff for Geneve. There's my layer 3. Uh, you notice I got layer 2. I got my source and destination MAC addresses. This is a Geneve header. So those addresses are TAP MAC addresses and or router interface mac addresses okay in the underlay network when i look at the layer three you'll see i got um, um, again source and destination ips it does support ip6 i didn't put it in here but it does have a source and destination ips now the ips here these are the tap ips so this is the geneve header so whenever i'm looking at that and again when you're doing packet captures you got to kind of understand all this um here's the vni id let me change my Marker so you can see it a bit better. Here's the VNI ID right there. Okay. Uh, that's the virtual network identifier. That's that 24 bit number I told you about, all the way up to possible uh, 16,777,000, whatever. Forget the exact number, but almost 17 million, right? So that's the VNI ID that distinguishes. Think of it like a VLAN ID. Okay. This is how we know uh, what VMs are on the same segment or not. Now, let me clear this. One of the things here is this variable length option variable length option field and that is um vxland didn't have that this field allows vendors to utilize it for vendor specific stuff whatever right this is the reason why vmware says okay we want to add on instead of just doing 1600 like we used to do with vxland um, we say, okay, we want that extra 100, 1700, just in case there's any future capabilities, right? So this is one of the things, one of the reasons why VMware now made that recommendation at least 1700. Now you might be going, well, Steve, I got 9,000 in my network. Yeah, hey, you're rocking and rolling, right? You're fine, okay? Just make sure any VM to VM communication in the overlay is not using 9,000. It's 200 less, like 8,800. So in case you wanted to, to let me back up. If I wanted VM1 talk to VM3 using jumbo frames, and I got 9,000 bytes down here, the jumbo frames here atop, I would just make it so it's 8,800, okay? So I still had that 200 overhead. If you only have 900 down here, the MTU, okay? So food for thought. 
let's do a packet walk this is not too difficult um so again we just seen this picture here i'm gonna have vm1 over here talking to vm2 um notice we're on the left side of the of the router here okay so we're over on this side great so when we look at this let me change my colors here when we look at this you'll see again so vm1 let's say vm1 is going to ping vm2 so right off the bat i know the uh, i know my source ip great it's me vm1's ip and i'm typing in ping i you know vm2's ip so i know the destination ip great uh then so that's my layer three stuff then my layer two vm1 basically says okay my source mac i know my i know my mac address great um and the destination mac mac 2 let's say let's say it goes I, i'll talk a little bit more about this in bum replication but let's say they've talked before uh and it, and it says okay I, I know it's mac 2 right so let's let's go uh let me put that in as well so let's say they've talked before so when you look here at the layer 2 field right if i zoom in a bit there we go you'll see the layer 2 source mac is mac 1 which is vm1 destination address mac2 right which is over here vm2 we look at the layer 3 stuff so we deal with source ip ip1 that's vm1's ip let me make it a bit smaller and then we see the destination ip is ip2 great okay so let's clear all this and put this back to normal so we see it leaves vm1 now it's going to hit the tap guess what the tap is going to do taps jobs to encapsulate decapsulate so bam we see here's the original payload right there. So if you examine that payload, you'll see it's exactly the same thing that left the VM. Nothing's changed. Great. But now we basically add on the Geneve header. So what do we see here? We see, first of all, the VNI ID of the segment, 5001, right there. Okay. You see the layer three stuff inside the Geneve header. That's the uh, source and destination IP. So if I zoom in a bit more on this, oops. So we see the source, the source address is tap one. Yeah, this is the tap it's coming from. Makes sense. Tap, tap dash IP dash one. That's the IP address of the tap. And the destination address is tap two's IP, tap dash IP dash two. There we go. So again, source and destination IP. When I look at the layer two stuff now, so the layer three will always have the source and destination of, of the taps, okay? The layer two is where things change, okay? In this case, these two taps are on the same subnet. This is a physical switch here, physical layer two switch. They're on the same subnet, okay? So we see the source tap here is the MAC address of tap one. Let me clean my diagram. See the source tap is there, the tap MAC one, great. The destination tap in this case is the MAC address of this tap over here, tap dash MAC2. So that's the that's the information. Uh, that will be what my Geneve header looks like. So it will arrive at the tap over here. The tap will examine the Geneve header and say, oh yeah, that's me, or, or sorry, um, that's me, all right. And it will take that header and rip it off and throw it away. It'll take the original, the Geneve payload, which is our layer two frame from VM1, and it will send it up the pipe. So let's put everything back to normal. And boom, we see it goes up there. So this here is exactly, is this here, what left this VM. So these two VMs are completely unaware of any of this stuff going on, any of this encapsulation down here. Now, how does it look when we, if I want to send uh, from VM1 to VM3. Again, they're on the same subnet. So a lot of people are going to see this gateway. Oh, they'll send it to their default gateway. No, right? The VMs aren't aware of this. These two VMs are on the same subnet, 172.16.10 slash zero, uh, dot zero or water dot X slash 24. Um, so when we look here, we see the what's, what's changed a bit. We see, well, let's go back to here. We see the source Mac is VM1. The destination MAC is MAC3. That's the VM3's MAC. Let's assume they were talking before. I'll talk about ARP and all that stuff, right? So great. And then we see the source IP is uh, VM1 and the destination IP is that of VM3, right? So now what's going to happen here, so that's what left VM1. It's going to hit the tap. Tap's going to encapsulate it. 
Here we see the Geneve header, okay? So again, very similar to what we saw before, but the, the TEP we're sending it to now is TEP3 over here, okay? So notice TEP3 has a TEP IP of 3 and a MAC address of TEP MAC3. So again, if I look at the Geneve information, the VNI 5001, sorry, I see the, um, the layer 3 information, the source TEP is TEP1, great. The destination TEP is TEP3, which is way over here, great. So that's going to stay the same. Those are source and destination taps. Now notice here, the source MAC, this is the layer two of the Geneve. The source MAC is tap MAC one. Yep, that's this guy right here. The destination MAC is RT MAC one. That's the router interface. Let me clear this, close this all up. So this here, the destination MAC, is this router's interface right here, because this is a layer two segment on this side. This is a different layer two segment on this side. So I get two different subnets between this router, okay? So it's gonna pass through the router, watch what happens. So it's passed through the routers. The payload never changed. The Geneve segment never changed, so it's still 5001. The layer three source and destination IP for the taps never changed. The only thing that's changed here, if you look carefully now, is the uh, source MAC is now route MAC two, it's this interface of the router and the destination mac now is the uh the tap mac 3 which is the mac address of this tap so let me go back to normal here so what did we see here so the geneve yeah the geneve header uh the layer 2 stuff will change the source and destination address of the macs depending on your physical environment like how many routers you're going through so what side of the router am I on, right? Okay, and same kind of example as before. This is gonna get sent up to the TAP. TAP's gonna look at the Geneve header and say, yep, that's me, all right. It's gonna take the Geneve, throw it in the garbage, take that um, original layer two uh, frame and send it up to VM3 over here. So you'll see that this here is the same. Oop, this is what left this VM. And it's not voodoo or magic or anything. That's what Geneve is doing. For those of you that are familiar with NSX for vSphere, very similar, almost exactly the same thing, except for we weren't using Geneve headers, it was VXLAN, which is pretty much the same darn thing. Let's talk about uh, bum traffic. Uh, this is not like somebody handing out, you know, what a, a panhandling or anything like that. Uh, bum traffic is basically broadcast unknown unicast and multicast traffic. So there are times when we need to broadcast traffic out across all the VMs on the same segment. A good example of this would be for an ARP, right? So how did like VM1 know where VM3 was or VM2? How does it know all that stuff? I was kind of just making an assumption that it knew all this and was able to create these, you know, the layer two frames. But suppose it needs to ARP. And this is when we, ha we have to be able to handle this a couple of different ways. So we can do what's called head replication or hierarchical two-tier replication, all right? This is the default, okay? Let's look at how we handle ARP traffic, okay? So let's say in this example, we're talking about head replication. This is not the default. Let's say VM1 over here wants to talk to VM8 way over here, okay? Let's say, again, they're on the same subnet, all right? So basically, let's say VM1, I'm gonna ping VM8. So I know my source IP, great. I know my destination IP because I'm typing in ping. So great, I know the IP of VM8, beautiful. Um, now, how about my layer two stuff? So first of all, since they're on the same subnet, the VM doesn't send it to its default gateway. So the VM's IP stack says, oh, we're on the same subnet. I need to build the layer two frame. So source MAC, it knows it's source MAC, pretty straightforward, but it doesn't know its destination MAC, right? It doesn't know this VM's destination. So we'll look at its ARP cache. It doesn't have it. This host will look in its cache. It, let's say they've never talked before. So how do we handle this replication? So one of the things it will do, instead of just blasting it across the network, and I didn't draw it in here, but if I do it in blue, I'll draw three nodes here. This is my central control plane. This is where those tables sit, the VTAP, MAC, and ARP tables, which we'll look at. So what will happen is this VM sends out that broadcast. It's an ARP. The host over here will say, hang on a second, before I blast it out to everybody, let me go ask the central control plane to look at it. First of all, let me back up a second. The host 
It sends it on the ARP. The host will look inside its tables. It has a set of VTEP, Mac, and ARP tables. It says, oh, you need to know the IP of VMA? Let me look at my tables. Oh, no, I don't have an entry. Or, oh, yes, I do. Boom, it gives it back, right? It sends an ARP reply back, right? Suppose if it doesn't have that information, then that transport node goes out to the, the central control plane. It'll go out and say, and this is across the management network. Management. Management network. Okay, I'm not showing management network here. So it'll ask central control plane, do you know anything about VM8? Central control plane will look at his tables, and if it says, yeah, I, I have it information, great. It fires it back. It says, here's the VM's IP, here's the TEP it's on, and all that wonderful stuff. And I'll show you the contents of the table in a second. And at that point, again, an ARP re reply will actually be sent to VM1. And what's really cool is VM8 never did get that ARP request, right? But well, we kind of, we knew it, and we gave it, and we uh, answered it back to some and we didn't what we see here is we didn't have to blast everything out across the network we didn't bug all these other vms just to figure out vm8 so that's kind of the advantage of having these tables inside the central control plane but let's the purpose of this exercise is to suppose if it doesn't have the set of tables what do we do then so this is what's going to happen let's draw this out so vm1 is going to send the arp out right there's the arp it's going to send it out we need to blast that across the network here. So what's going to happen is this is head replication. So the, and this is going to get really messy. The source tap, which is on the left here, that's the source tap. It's going to take that broadcast, encapsulate inside Geneva, and send it to this tap. It's also going to do it to this tap. It's going to fire it across the network. Send it to this guy. Make another one. Send it to this guy. Make another, like I said, it's going to get messy here. So it's doing this to all these guys. So it took that broadcast and replicated it out to all the other transport nodes. Well, why didn't it do it to node 9? Because node 9 does not have a VM running on top of it. I didn't put a VM there. So it knows from its set of tables, oh, um, these transport nodes are participating in the web segment. Okay, and I'll show you those tables shortly. Now, what's each tap going to do? Well, all these purple lines, the taps at the destination taps are going to have to take that, decapsulate that broadcast, and send it up. So here's the decapsulated broadcast. It's going to send it up to each of their VMs. Decapsulates it, sends it up, sends it up, sends it up, sends it up. Each VM will look at that and says, no, that's not me, no, not me, no, not me, and drop it, right? Except for VM8, which will say, yes, that is me. Okay? And what does VM8 do at this point? It's an ARP request. It's going to build an ARP reply and send it back. Now, we don't have to blast it across everybody. We just take that reply, encapsulate it, and fire it right back to that source tap. We know where it came from, okay? And then it gets decapsulated and sent up to here, okay? That's head replication. This is not the default. If you look at head replication, um, oh, my picture got a little messy, but in this one example, I had to, the tap over here on the far left had to replicate that request one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times. It had to encapsulate that broadcast, put it inside a Geneva frame, and then fire it out to those um, seven hosts. So as if I had 200 hosts, all right? So you see uh, where this can get your network a bit congested, right? Especially if you're doing a lot of multicast or broadcast or whatever, right? The default mode is two-tier or hierarchical replication, two-tier or hierarchical. So same kind of concept as before. We'll say VM1 wants to talk to VM8. Um, let's say they've never talked before. Nobody, uh, transport node one doesn't have information in its cache. Let's say the central control plane, for whatever reason, doesn't have it, or maybe the control plane's down, right? That'd be a good example. So we're gonna take that, that ARP, that broadcast, fire it down to the tap. Now this is two tier. The source tap says, okay, I need to encapsulate that just like before. And it's going to send it to this host's tap and this host tap. Nothing's different from head replication. Now, how does it handle the remote segments? These are different subnets. So how does it handle the taps in there? Again, this transport node has a list of all the taps participating on this web tier. It knows this, okay? Um, which you'll see when I talk about the tables. So it's going to look at that and say, okay, I need to pick one of the nodes over on each segment um, as a as an MTAP or, or as a proxy. So let's say it's going to send it over to this guy. So he's an MTAP or a proxy. 
What that means is that there's a replicate bit set inside the Geneve header. It tells this tap on node four, you need to replicate this for me. So it says, okay, I'm gonna replicate it to these guys in my segment, because it knows those guys are participating on that segment. It knows because it's in the tables. And then the source tap over here would do the same thing with this segment. Maybe it'll pick this as its M tap. M tap, M tap. I don't like the word, I don't like M tap. But anyways, it doesn't really matter, it's a proxy. So it knows I need to replicate it here. It doesn't need to replicate it to node nine because it's not participating on that segment. Its tap is not in the tables. And just as before, we take that broadcast, decapsulate it, send it up to all the VMs, just like before. Each VM would receive it and say, no, not me, no, not me, again, and drop it. And then number eight would say, yep, that's me, all right. And then it does the ARP reply back, okay? What's the advantage of this solution? This is the default. This, the advantage here is this tap, the source tap on the far left, had to encapsulate and send up the frame three times. Sorry, we got one, two, and then three and four. So it's, it's less, less work for that source tap with two-tier replication. Again, like I said, this is the, the default settings uh, when you create your segments. Uh, you can change that if you want. Um, you could even change it on a per segment basis. I want this guy to be using two tier and this gun using head replication if you want to. I don't know of a good reason to change it over to head replication today. Um, uh, maybe if you've got some kind of Geneve bridge or something like that in your environment, some kind of hardware Geneve bridge, and it doesn't understand what two tier is, you may have to make that segment uh, head replication. That's, you know, that's the only thing I could possibly think of. So this is how we handle broadcast and unknown newcast. Let's take a look at populating the control uh, plane tables. I've done this myself and a buddy of mine, Tim Burkhardt at VMware, um, uh, at VMworld sessions. So let's look at how we populate these tables. And I will demo this when we get into the demo portion. That will be part two of the segments here, okay? So when we look at this picture here, first of all, you'll see I got a bunch of transport nodes. I got host one, host two, host three. I even threw in a KVM host over here. Now, a little disclaimer, as of 4.x, KVM transport nodes are not supported anymore. So I'll be modifying this slide, but just for completeness, for anybody playing with anything pre-NSX4, this would be a valid drawing, okay? Um, you'll see that, sorry, you'll see that uh, the, uh, my host has these taps on them. There's the taps, just a single tap each. I'm not showing management networks. See, I got my management cluster over here, my central control plane. Uh, so you'll see on host one and host two are on the left segment. And the left segment's 10.10, sorry, 10.10.10.x. So this tap IP of host one will be 10.10.10.11. This guy will be 10.10.10.10.12. You'll see the MAC addresses. So this tap's MAC address, I called it MACVT1. This tap MAC address, I called it MAC VT2. If any of you have taken VMworld sessions before, um, I, myself and Tim actually did some stuff on this. If I look at the right side, you'll see the same thing. So I got my subnet for my taps is 10, 10, 10, 20. And this tap IP will be 10, 10, 20, 11. And this one will be 10, 10, 20, 12. And you'll see the MAC addresses for each of the taps, MAC VT3, MAC VT4, that's the MAC addresses. When you look at the VMs now, you see all the VMs are powered off, okay? You'll see VMA has an IP address of VMA-IP, and its MAC address is AAAA. You'll see VMB has a VM IP of VMB-IP and a MAC address of BBBB, and so far, so on and so forth, for, uh, D and E and F, and whatever, okay? Um, what else did I want to point out here? You'll see I got two segments. I got my green segment, which is VNI 5002, and I got a red segment, which is VNI 5001. Technically, I really don't care what the VNIs are as long as they're separate or different for each segment. Okay. Uh, last thing I want to point out, you'll see the dotted lines here. This is just to illustrate what VMs or what host the VMs are running on. So, uh, so these two VMs, VMs A and B, will run on host one. VMD on host two, VME over here, VMC over here, and VMF over here, okay? And like I mentioned before, KVM is no longer supported in 4.0, so this, I could just say ESX 04 if I wanted to, all right? Just uh, for, you, for those of you out there that are familiar with this. 
So all the VMs are powered off. Let's look at the tables. Now, there's a couple of ways you can examine the tables. Uh, you can actually download them down the spreadsheet. I'll show you this. You can do it from a command line. That's what I'm, I'm actually do, uh, quite familiar with. So here they're showing me the command I can run on my NSX manager. So I go into the command line and I can type in get logical switch 5001. So I got to know the VNI. Oops, right here. Uh, and then I just want to look at the VTAP tables. If I want to look at the MAC table, I type get logical switch 5001 MAC table. And then last but not least, if you want to look at the ARP table, get logical switch 5001 uh, space ARP table. So again, there's the commands you can run. So right now, let me back up. All these VMs are turned off. So the tables are empty. What do we see inside the tables? Now, there's a bunch of other stuff that you'll see here. Um, I pulled, the, I, I'm just, I'm condensing this to, for the more important information. You'll, so you'll see each table, whether it's a VTAP table or a MAC table or ARP table, each will have the, VN, the VNI ID. Uh, and then you'll actually see, um, yeah, you'll actually see the VNI ID inside each one of them. Okay. Now, before I begin powering on machines, each segment, each segment gets its own set of VTAP, MAC, and ARP tables. So you see the green segment here is 5002. Uh, it's, it has its set of tables right here. The red segment, VNI 5001, has a set of tables right here. So if you got a thousand segments, you got a VTAP, MAC, and ARP table for each one. All that's stored on your central control plane. So let's power on. Let's power on VMA. So we're going to power on VMA, um, which we expect to see here. So let's go forward. So what happens is when you power on VMA, the local control plane on this transport node will do, in this case, it'll do a VTAP report. It will send a VTAP report to the management, so the, sorry, to the central control plane. So it's going to send it out to whichever node's in charge of it, maybe node one, two, or three, whatever. We'll show you that when we talk more about um, central control plane and whatnot, or troubleshooting. Um, so it's going to basically send out a, a TEP report to the central control plane saying, hey, I got VM1 powering on right now on segment, sorry, segment 5001, the red segment, right? Uh, you need to update your, your, your TEP table. So it's going to populate the TEP table. What do we see here? We see we have the VNI ID, great. 5001. We see the TAP IP. So this VM is utilizing this TAP, which is 10.10.10.11, right there. This is the subnet it's on. And then what's the MAC address of the VTAP? Well, this is MAC VT1. So this is what I would expect to see in the tables. The, uh, the local control plane will also send another report. It's called the MAC report, basically telling the central control plane, update your MAC table. So it's going to say, hey, this is segment 5001. Here's the VM's MAC, double A, you know, AAAA. And here is the TAP IP that the VM's on. I call this the magic table, okay? I've heard this expression before. Um, I call it the magic table. The reason why is because it says, hey, if you want to talk to VM A, there's the TAP it's on. So this is one of the tables I know um, how to figure out what VM, what tap the VM is running on okay and last but not least we do an ARP report uh, sorry an IP report well, which will populate the ARP table with 5001 the VNI the IP address of the VM and the MAC address of the VM so this is what we should expect to see if I don't see this then I hit the brakes and figure out what's wrong okay now let's power on another one so Let's power on VMB over here. So we're going to power on VMB. Um, and again, it's on the red segment. So again, what we're going to see now is we have the MAC table being updated with a second entry and the ARP table being updated with a second entry. Those are the entries for the VMB, right? You can check those out. But why didn't we put another entry in here? There's still only one entry in the tap table. Why? It's because it's the same tap. VM A and VM B are using that single tap. Why put a duplicate entry? Now, if this transport node had multi taps, and we talked about that in preparing the hosts, right? If it did have two taps, it's quite possible we may see a second entry here. Quite possible. We, it's not a guarantee, but 
in my example here, we probably would. Okay, great. So this is what we should expect to see. Now, these two VMs are on the same transport node. Let's power on a VM somewhere else. So we power on this VM here, VM E on host three, transport node three. So what we'll see now is when we power it on, it's a different transport node. It's never been registered. So you'll see that, boom, there's the entry for that tap inside our tap table, 10, 10, 20, 11. So I know VM E is on tap 10. Sorry, I don't, don't know that yet. So this is the tap that it's on. There's the subnet, and there's the MAC address of the tap. When I look at the MAC table, again, it shows me VM E is on this tap, 10, 10, 20, 11, which is this one right here. And if I look at this table, 10, 10, 20, 11, I know the MAC address. So by utilizing both tables, I can figure out where a VM is. And last but not least, again, we have the VM's IP and we have the VM's MAC address. So by utilizing these tables. Now, what happens here is the central control plane, since we now have two transport nodes pop, uh, populated here or, or participating, um, it, the central control plane is going to basically take these tables, all three of them, and it's going to send it down to transport node one and send it down to transport node two. Sorry, three over here. Sorry about that. So when you look at, you can examine the tables on the host. If you look at the tables on the host, I'll show you troubleshooting in another video. Uh, I would be able to see, oh yeah, this is what the host sees. This is what the central control plane sees. Great, everything's working good. Or maybe, no, that's not what I'm seeing. Something's missing here. Then at that point, you got to figure out kind of what's going on, right? And I'll talk about troubleshooting in another video. Um, so that's it. that's it. Now I just want to do one more here. It's, a, it's a kind of a trick one that I always do to uh, my students. So I'm going to power on VMF over here. So when I power on VMF, I wonder how many entries I'll see in this table and in this table and in this table. And the trick here is noticing where VMF is. It's on the green segment, a different VNI. So it would not go in those 5001 tables. It would be populated down here in this set of tables, okay? So I always like to point that out, okay, folks? Um, um, one of the questions I usually get is what happens if the central control plane dies, right? If the central control plane dies. These tables are, still exist inside your transport nodes, so communication still works. What's the part, where does it fall apart and, and st you start having issues? is if your central control plane died, you lost all three nodes, all right? You lost all three. If all of a sudden I decide I'm gonna power on VMD here, I'm gonna power it on, right? Um, if I decide to power that on, um, in an older version of NSXT, I can't remember, it was like version two something, it wouldn't let you power it on. But if that was, if this was true here, again, central control plane's dead and you decide for whatever reason I'm powering on this VM, you won't be able to talk to that VM. And the reason for that is this tap does not exist in this table. There was, since these, the, since the control plane is down, we had no way of telling the control plane, nor all the other hosts, that VMD is being powered on and where it's located. So we don't know. Now here's a, let's, let me give you another example. Let's say my control plane is dead. This is how we look, right? Control plane's dead. I now decide I'm gonna power on another VM. Let's say I'm going to power on another VM on host three here. Host two. Yeah, host two. It's VMG, whatever. Right? So I power on a VM here. I wonder if it will work. Well, it would work. And the reason why we'd be able to talk to it, even though we can't update central control plane tables, host one is already aware of... Uh, oh, sorry. You know what? No, it wouldn't work. Never mind. Sorry about that. I was I made a mistake. Uh, let's say I was powering it up on host three. Sorry, here's VMG. VMG. I'm going to power it on host three. Would it work? Yes, it would because host three already exists in the tap tables. So host one knows about host three. Remember we talked about replication, bum replication, uh, just before this. It would say, oh, I need to send that broadcast down to host three's tap and have it sent up to VMG. So we would be able to talk to it. Okay, so. The moral of the story is, if your transport, if your control plane is down, fix it, okay? Another thing it won't let you do, if control plane is down, for those of you that are familiar with vMotion, 
I want to migrate a VM running live while it's running to another host. It will not let you do a vMotion, okay? Uh, I haven't tried it in 4.1, but it <laughs> probably won't let you, okay? Uh, and that makes sense, because if I try to do a vMotion, well, when I vMotion my VM, we need a way of updating the table saying VM A is no longer on this transport node. It's now on whatever, this transport node. we got to put an entry in there for it. So, uh, again, when we vMotion VMs around in an SX environment, we need to update the center control plane, and the center control plane needs to update all the other transport nodes saying, hey, we just vMotioned, this VM is now over here. That's not, you know, and that's not a big deal, but again, um, it, um, so again, if control plane's down, you won't be able to do vMotions or anything, which to me is, I, I think is a good thing. NSX for vSphere, anybody played with that, it allowed you to do it, and it created all kinds of potential issues, which we won't get into. That's it. So you stuck around this long. I appreciate it. Please hit that subscribe button. If you found this even a little bit useful, hit the like button as well. Uh, by subscribing to the channel, it allows me to build content. Um, and that's it. So this was part one. I'm going to, uh, part two um, will be linked. You'll, you'll have a link probably up here, up here, wherever. You'll have a link uh, to see the demo of this. And I'll demo the populating of the tables as well. Okay. So you'll see that what I was talking about just recently is not BS. So thanks again, everybody. Have a great day. See you in part two. Bye-bye.